Hope everybody's had a good day so far, and I hope it only gets better from here. I'll make it a little better by pulling that away. <laughs> Let's get started on 264 in the garden. Page 264. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Amen. I'm glad he's in the garden with us, at work with us, wherever we go, he's there. Thank God for that. Good to see you tonight. Beautiful day today. Not real hot, just kind of nice. And, and Jeff, I tell you, I think I saw everywhere I went today people getting hay up. <laughs> they were busy doing that today. I saw about four or five places. I was driving the bus where they were loading it up. I thought, I don't miss that one little bit. <laughs> But uh, it is good to see you tonight. Hope everybody, like Cody said, hope everybody's had a good week. And hope you came expecting to get something from the Lord. And uh, so we begin the book of Joel, a little book, three chapters, but there's a lot in there. And uh, we're going to begin that study tonight. Got a lot of things we need to be praying for. Let's continue with Brooke. I talked to her just a little bit ago. She's doing okay. Said everything went well. And uh, so she said she'd see us Sunday. Uh, but she's doing really good. And she said her daughter was doing some better. Uh, they changed her medicine again. She still can't, doesn't have any feeling in her uh, legs and uh, feet, but they changed her medicine. They, they're thinking that's what it was, it was the medicine. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep praying for her and remember her. Can you remember Billy in our prayers also and Charlie? Uh, and uh, remember Melissa also and uh, just continue to lift them up. How's Natalie doing, Jonathan? Can you remember Natalie also with her shoulder? I just pray that God just touch that. Uh, let's remember all those 
<coughs> that we've been mentioning that have been sick. Let's can you remember David Falls. I thought about him today. I saw that today was his birthday, so let's remember uh, him in our prayers and the situation that he's facing. And uh, let's remember our country. Uh, a lot of craziness going on right now. And uh, uh, the more I see, the more I see well, uh, things that are going on, the more that it makes me realize, and I hope it makes you realize this, that what we are seeing is a spiritual battle. Uh, we are seeing a battle of good versus evil in this country. And uh, and there are some on both sides that are good, and there are some on both sides that are evil, more on one than the other, it seems. Uh, but it is a battle of good and evil. And uh, we need to stand up for what's right and uh, make our voices heard. And uh, that's why things are in the shape they are now. Because Christians for too long have sat back and said nothing. And uh, let, let a small minority of people uh, have their way uh, because they stand and let their voices be. They're a small group, but they make the most noise. And we need to make noise uh, for the cause of Christ. Anything else that we need to remember tonight? Jeff. Yeah. Yes. I know I saw him, what, been, what, about a month ago? And I don't even think he recognized me. And so, uh, yeah, it's sad to see that happen. Michael's, what, he's your age? Yeah, I thought he was a year, a year or so younger than I am. Well, let's do remember Mike and his wife also. And uh, how many children? They got one. Two boys. I knew. I knew the one because I worked with him, but I didn't. We live in a backwards world, and uh, <clears throat> we just need to pray for pray for our chief, our, our uh, chief justices and the chief justice and our Supreme Court justices. Continue to lift them up and pray for their safety. Uh, those, you know they they're protesting in front of their homes, which is against the law. Yes, that's why. Let's remember that his last name's Church, so just remember them in our prayers. Anybody else? Jonathan. Go 
du har det. Tak for enig. Eva. Yes, I remember our kids, they got this in the grade testing, stressful time. Uh, so let's remember them. Not just for them, it's stressful for teachers, but especially for the kids. Uh, if they get ready to do that, so let's pray for them. Pray they'll do well, do their best. Anybody else? Yes, Carol. Carla. Remember that family. <coughs> that's very. That's rare. That's a rare a case. Let's remember that family. Anybody else? Traveling yes, y'all be leaving Tuesday. Okay, let's remember them that are traveling. And let her, God just be with them. Yeah, Sharon and mom and dad are in Chalot, traveling to the beach, and trying to get some stuff done. We're there. Remember them. Okay, anybody else? Right, let's remember all these. If you can remember the service tonight, pray God just to meet with us. Pray He help you remember your homework. <laughs> uh, I'm getting a lot of empty looks on that one. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jeff, you lead us to the Lord. All right, let's continue on on page 295. <clears throat> he leadeth me. <clears throat> he leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, Still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me. His 
his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Amen. Let's continue on, on page 349. And if we allow God to lead us and we trust in God, we can know that there will be showers of blessings not only every day, which there are already, but in the eternal home he has prepared for us. <clears throat> All right, 2, 3, 49. There shall be showers of blessing. This is a promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above, showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing, come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead, there 
shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing. Now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. <clears throat> okay, Book of Joel. If anybody want to give it a try, starting at Genesis. You going to give it a try? Go for it. Stand up so we can hear you. So your voice will project. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. She remembered them. Yay. <laughs> Anybody else? That, yeah, that was a Awana and Wednesday night. Well, she wasn't Wednesday night kids with me, but uh, we did that several times with kids when we were at Star Town. I'm telling you what, we had one. Y'all remember Elizabeth that came and sang uh, for Bob Bennett Christmas? Tell you what, that kid could rattle those things off. Yeah, you had to slow her down. She'd just go wide open for every time, but. Uh, very, very intelligent child, her and her sister both, and uh, very intelligent. So, work on them. <laughs> I guess I could do like I did with them. We went over them like for first 10 minutes of class every night. We would go, we'd, we'd add a couple every week until we got all those, but uh, it's important. And again, the reason I want you to know them is because it's important that we know we're, we're, we're looking in God's Word and what's in there. And uh, so it's very important. So Book of Joel, second of the minor prophets uh, that we're looking at. And, of course, this is a very small book. And uh, if you remember, uh, how many of y'all have read the books, Lord of the Rings? Anybody read the books? Well, how many have seen the movies? Well, uh, the, the movies are, are different than the books. I'll tell you, they're different a little bit. Of course, the hobbits in the books have one more foot than the hobbits in the movie. They have three feet in the book. They are three-footed creatures, okay, and they're small. But if you remember, even in the movies, of course, in that, in that whole series, uh, trilogy of movies, that they go from one uh, great adventure, one um, great event to the next, and <coughs> in a place, and of course, you know, where everything takes place is called Middle Earth. And they got to, what they're trying to do is to take the ring and destroy it. And, of course, uh, the hobbits, the smallest of the creatures, are the ones that are taking it. And uh, the whole, I guess the whole theme of that series is uh, that we shouldn't underestimate small things. God uses small things. And uh, in this book, this small book that we're going to look at tonight, there, even though it is a small book, just again, three chapters, there is a great multitude of, of truth and things that we can learn and, uh, as we go through this book. So we're going to kind of begin tonight and kind to give an introduction and a setting for this book. And uh, as we've done with some of the others, <coughs> we'll begin by looking at the person of the book. Of course, the writer of this book is Joel, and it tells us that in verse number 1. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. How would you like to have a dad named Pethuel? Uh, some weird names, but that's, all, that's really all we're told about him, about uh, uh, Joel, is that uh, his father. Uh, the name Joel means uh, Jehovah is God. So again, this probably speaks of the, the faith that his family had uh, in the fact that they named him Joel, which means Jehovah is God, uh, probably declaring their faith and uh, their love for God. 
He, his residence is not given. We don't know where he's from, what area. Uh, most Bible scholars believe that he was from Judah, perhaps lived in Jerusalem. Uh, he did prophesy to uh, Ju Judah and to Jerusalem. Uh, so we really don't know a lot about him, but God does. And uh, I was thinking today, you know, there are a lot of people that are not famous when it comes to in spiritual circles. I mean, how many of you in here have never heard of Charles Stanley? We've all heard of Charles Stanley, have we not? We all have heard of people like Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, uh, Greg Laurie, and many of these other people. Uh, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, we all know these people. But not many of y'all would know a man by the name of Burl Greer. Nobody knows him? I figured y'all might know him. He's from up toward Boone area. A long time ago. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, and a great mountain preacher at the time. So, but you know, and he's been faithful through the years to preach God's word. Uh, so, you know, we may not know these some of these people, and they may be considered small when in the spiritual circles. But God still uses them in a great and mighty way. And so He did with Joel, even though we don't know a lot about him. Also, we will see the period of the book. Now, unlike Isaiah and Hosea and Amos and others, uh, Joel doesn't really give us the location uh, or doesn't really tell us the time period of his uh, prophecy. Uh, most Bible scholars believe that he prophesied sometime between uh, 838 and 756 B.C. And there's a couple reasons for this that they believe this. No mention of the uh, Assyrian uh, invasion of Israel or the Babylonian invasion so he had to prophesy before these events took place so that's when they usually date this uh, <coughs> he does mention Tyre and Sidon and Egypt and Edom who were uh, Israel's enemies during the reign of King Joash so they kind of date it to that period even though we're not really told for sure also this would coincide with the time that uh, Queen Athaliah was on the throne. Any of y'all remember Queen Athaliah? Wicked woman. There's one teacher I used to have would say she was a wicked, a wicked woman. Uh, we, we know about Jezebel. I mean, most people, we remember Jezebel. Well, Athaliah was just as bad, if not worse. She wanted to be on the throne. So after the king of that time had died, she killed all of her grandchildren, her grandchildren who would have sit on the throne, she killed all of them but one. One escaped. One was taken and hid in the temple for safety. Uh, so she sat on the throne and uh, had all of her grandchildren put to death, but little Joash was spared. And, of course, when he uh, was seven years old, or about eight years old, uh, he was crowned king in Judah. So, and... Poor Queen Athaliah, after she had slain her grandchildren, was slain by her own court, uh, royal court. So uh, she met a <coughs> disastrous end also. So we see the person of the book, the period of the book. Let me go back a little bit. <coughs> In Joel's writing this book, he's writing to the nation of Israel, uh, or of Judah, and especially to the city of Jerusalem. And he is prophesying, and we'll see this even in chapter 1, he's prophesying against uh, the uh, priesthood, against what's taking place in the temple. Uh, he's prophesying against all of these things that, that, are, that are wrong, that Israel is, or Judah is doing wrong. Uh, he uses the name Israel, but he's not referring to the ten tribes. He's referring to, of course, Judah. And he... Uh, he will refer to the 12 tribes when he talks about the day of the Lord in chapter 3. And we're going to look at some different days. We're going to talk about five different, I think it's five different days. Uh, it might not get there tonight, that, but I don't want you to get confused about those. We might actually get there. Uh, but uh, keep, kind of keep them separated. It's easy to get confused on them, but we, we'll get to those in just a little bit. Now, what's the point of the book? Why did he write this book? The day of the Lord, we see that phrase some five times in the book of Joel. It's mentioned in 
chapter 1, verse 15, chapter 2, verses 1 and 11, and 31, and in chapter 3, verse 14. And here it has a reference to the judgment, local judgment, that God was going to bring on Judah. Now when we hear the day of the Lord, what event do we think of? We think of the day that he's coming back. We think of the day of the Lord as that. So when he references the day of the Lord here, again he is talking about the judgment that's coming on Judah uh, at this time, but also a, not just this time, but also a future uh, day of judgment that he's going to talk about. So Joel's day, he's not again not talking about just the, the future, but also in his day. And he'll use some different names for, for some of these. Uh, we're going to find that there's a plague here in chapter 1 and uh, an invasion. And it, it's a picture he uses at the beginning of chapter 1, a picture to talk about this invasion of a, of a nation that is coming in. He uses a picture of locusts. Well, let's look at some of these days, uh, days of Scripture, and, and put them in perspective. First of all, there's a day of man. We don't hear much about the day of man. And that phrase is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. And Paul uses that, and he says this, he says, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. So many Bible scholars say that he's talking about a day of man's... It's the day that we're living in now. It is the day of man. Man is in, you know, we know that God's on the throne, God's in control, but man makes the rules right now, Do we, does he not? We see that with our government, with the governments of the world. So we are living in the day of man, and uh, we're living in that day, and uh, for the most part, I don't want to say God that God is silent, but God it does... Um, he has given us his word and he speaks through his word, but he's not dealing with mankind in a way that he will in the future. And I hope you don't misunderstand that, but he is dealing with man, but not as much so as he will directly in the future. He deals with us through his word and through the Holy Spirit at this point in time. So Paul was not you know, concerned with the opinion of a human court uh, so much, but he didn't realize that they were in control. But then there's a second day, another day, the day of Christ. Paul to the Philippians said this. He said, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul mentions this day again and again. What day is he talking about when he mentions the day of Jesus Christ? His what? His return. His return. When he comes back, that is the day of Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord. That's what we see read many, many times. It is the day of Christ. It's the day when we will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. We'll be together with him as in Thessalonians it tells us that. So that's the day of Christ. But then the next one is the day of the Lord. Okay, now I want you to keep these separate. Even though the day that, that he comes back for the, the church is called the day of Christ, sometimes references the day of the Lord. Many times when the day of the Lord is mentioned, it speaks of a time of judgment, a dark, gloomy time. It is when he will come back, not to take his church, but afterwards when he returns and steps on the earth and, and he, his judgment is poured out on the nations. Okay, That is the day of the Lord. It's a dark, gloomy day. He talks about that in chapter 2, and we'll see that after a little while. But uh, <coughs> It's found time and time again in the, in the Old Testament, at least 18 times. This day is talked about in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, this day of judgment. Now this is what I thought was very interesting. It's talked about 18 times in the Old Testament, but only four times in the New Testament. 
Those Old Testament prophets spoke more about the coming judgment of God than the New Testament writers did. New Testament writers write more about what? About salvation, about grace, the church. But these Old Testament prophets were, were, were proclaiming and, and giving this prophecy that in the future there's going to be a day when God will pour out His judgment, His wrath on those who reject Him. And so 18 times in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord re refers to the direct intervention of God in the affairs of men after the rapture of the church. So you have the day of Christ and then the day of the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord probably covers the time from uh, the tribulation period. Of course, that's when God will be judging who? The nation of Israel for the most part. And of course, everyone else who has rejected him. <coughs> it will cover the millennial kingdom now, after the rapture of the church, after the tribulation period. There will be a thousand year reign of Christ. This is part of the day of the Lord. And then also the great white throne judgment. When all those who have not received Jesus Christ will stand before him and they'll be judged. And that's where they'll hear those words in Matthew. Depart from me, I never knew you. What sad words that is that people will hear. And uh, it's a time of judgment on the wicked but it is a time of blessing on those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and also those of Israel who have accepted uh, Jesus Christ. So it is a day of blessing. And that day uh, is a good, it's a great day. It will be a day of blessing for the church also. Another day we need to mention is the day of God. Peter talks about it when he says <coughs> in 2 Peter chapter 3, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So the day of God is the eternal day after everything ends here on earth. It is eternity will be the day of God when he will sit on the throne. Of course, Jesus is God. He'll be on the throne and will forever worship God. Him. And you notice what it says there? And even in 2 Peter, it said that it is the day of God. One eternal day. Why? Because there's no night. No need for sun, no need for the moon. Who's the light of that city? God. Jesus is the light of that city. And it'll be one eternal day. So, very little. It's said about this day in the Bible, you know, except that it's going to last forever. And uh, we only know that all the rest of eternity, God will be uh, all that we need. He'll be all in all. And we'll worship Him for all eternity. So, in this book, Joel is going to talk about some things that are happening right, right at the time. Uh, he's going to talk about some things that are going to happen in the future. Uh, and he's going to talk about things that happen... Uh, in the past, and we're going to look at these as we go on. So he's going to begin in chapter 1 with a plague. So things present, chapter 1, 1 through 21. <coughs> now, when we're in a crisis, just for example, we're getting ready to enter hurricane season, right? Now, we, when, when a hurricane hits, we hear everything under the sun about what causes the hurricane, don't we? Of course, the big thing now that's causing hurricanes is what? Global warming or climate change. It's because of you know, all that we have done to the environment causing these hurricanes. Well, you know what? There have been hurricanes since the beginning of time. They have taken place. And now all of a sudden it's all because of climate change and, and global warming. But, and we hear these things, all kinds of things cause these crises. We hear, we hear of shootings. What causes the shootings? The gun. <laughs> yeah. There's been murder since the beginning of time, and they didn't have guns. As a matter of fact, the first murder was committed with what? A rock. I mean, with a rock. You don't need, you don't need guns. And so, you know, when you hear this, it's about guns. Or it's about the way you were raised. It's because because my dad 
was, left our family and it was just us and our mom. And that makes us, you know, that's our excuse. So we hear all these things and, and things going on. So all kinds of voices that tell us what's going on. And sometimes we'll hear voices that will say, well, this crisis is not going to last. Be brave. Then some will say, well, it's going to get worse. Huh. Do we not hear that in our day now? Oh, uh, thank you know, some people are saying, well, things are going to get better. Some people, things are going to get worse. Well, you know what? The Bible tells us they're going to get worse. But for us that know Jesus Christ, things are going to get a lot better. Amen. Because one day we're not going to be here. So when you hear all these, you know, you hear these voices, and some people say we're done for. And uh, uh, the alarmist, <coughs> some people, when crisis hits, and, and even in, in what we're seeing in our country now, people, people are so fearful that they think that the enemy's hiding behind every tree. Everything that happened. There are some, you know, there's an enemy there that's causing something. So, you know, <coughs> and, you know, you, we can't trust the news. We can't trust anything that's going on. So, Joel was a realist, and he looked at everything from the standpoint of the Word of God. And that's what we've got to do. As God's children, we've got to look to the Word of God. So he begins in chapter 1, and he talks about a devastation. He says there, there was a devastation, a plague of locusts. Matter of fact, let's read a little bit of this. He says, here, uh, verse number 2, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Verse number 2, he said, he's going to describe what's happening in just in the next verses, but... He, he's saying, have you ever seen anything like what is going on right now? And of course their answer was, no. My question to you is this, have we ever seen anything going on in not just our nation, but in the world like we are seeing now? With all the craziness and stuff that is going on. And again, our answer would be, <coughs> no. We've never seen things the way that they are. So, this whole country was in the grip of locusts, and we'll see that. He says, tell ye your children of it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. Okay, so he's saying, this is something that you need to share from generation to generation to generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. So all this devastation, everything's been eaten. Now, I was looking up some of the stuff, I, you know, we don't have much of a problem in this country with locusts. I'm not that I know of. I've never heard of us having a plague of locusts in our country. They might outweigh some, but not around here. So I was looking up some information about locusts. They're like big grasshoppers. Grasshoppers on steroids. That's <laughs> about what they are. And a swarm of locusts, this is amazing to me, a swarm of locusts, it, they may be numbered up to 600 million insects in one swarm of these locusts. They can cover, they cover 400, a swarm that big will cover 400 square miles. They eat up to, this is man. They eat more than I do. They could eat up to 8,000 tons of food a day, a swarm that big. Can you imagine what that does to a crop? 8,000 tons. Uh, they, uh, they travel 2,000 miles per month at a speed of between 2 and 10 miles per day. And so uh, they lay... 5,000 eggs per square foot. Their appetite is very, well, you know, it's, it's, they got an appetite. And so, but it, they say, and I've never seen a locust up close, but they say their heads look like horses. Jeff, have you ever seen one up close? That neither. But they say they look, their head looks like horses. And someone described a locust as the incarnation of hunger. Incarnation of hunger. One lady was speaking to another lady on Monday morning. She said, she made this statement. She said, I had the locust preacher at my house the other day. 
And that woman said, don't you mean the local preacher? A locust is something that eats everything that's put in front of it. She said, nope, that was the preacher, all right. <laughs> it was a locust preacher. Yeah. So Joel describes this, and, and he says, in verse number 4, he says, he says they've eaten everything. They've, they've left nothing behind. So <clears throat> whatever the devastation was, everything that took place, Joel's asking in these first verses, have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen such devastation? And again, uh, so what we're seeing is probably locusts, lo more locusts and more locusts. All the, it takes us back to the book of Exodus and the plagues uh, that were placed on, on, the, on Egypt. <coughs> so the land was stripped bare. So a whole lot of people, when you read this, this is what you're going to find. A whole lot of people can see the locusts but very few people were seeing the Lord in our day. A lot of people are seeing what's going on, but very few are seeing the Lord. We're seeing the devastation. We're seeing the, the, the wickedness of people, but very few are seeking the Lord and looking to Him. And that's what was happening in Joel's day also. <coughs> Four different names uh, that he uses here. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know what these different things are. One writer I was reading said he, that he thinks what Joel was doing was describing four different stages of the locust, the life of the locust. And so that could be, or it could be four different types of, of insects. I don't know. Uh, but one writer said he thought it was their four different stages. So again, devastation, everything barren, and... Uh, and after everything barren it, and this could apply to people also four chief passions of these people the Israelites was lust vainglory gluttony and anger they destroyed everything they came in contact with Israel did we see that time and time again just like these locusts not just the locusts, but also the Assyrian army that was going to come in was very much the same. So, what's our locust? Do we have a locust in our life? What is it that causes us to bring, to be barren in our life? In Galatians, we are told to do what? To bear fruit. What causes us not to bear fruit? causes us not to bear the fruit that God wants us to. What? Disobedience? Could be disobedience. Could be, could just be laziness. Could be that we're comfortable. Man, I, God help us as a church to never get comfortable. When a church gets comfortable, a church will fall asleep. And it will... When you get still, when something is comfortable and something just sits in the same spot, what happens to it? It becomes stagnant. Okay? You get stagnant. Sometimes this is what happens. Sometimes at our house, I hope it, you know, not often, but sometimes, somebody will leave something sitting out. Okay? And after a few days, you go back and look at it, and it has green fuzz on it. Anybody else ever had that happen? <laughs> Are we the only one? You know, sometimes I'll take a cup in my office and I'll have tea or Kool-Aid or something in it and I've got a, a, a coaster sitting in the window sill and I'll set it there. Well, I'll go back in the kitchen or somewhere and forget that cup's there and a couple of days later go back and it's growing penicillin. Okay? It, and so it, it gets stagnant and when things get stagnant, they become worthless. God help us as a church not to become stagnant. God help us to continue to bear fruit and to see uh, him, him glorified in everything that we do. So, again, is it laziness? Maybe it's a half-hearted attitude. One of my favorite words is lackadaisical. I don't know why, I just like the sound of that word. That's what a half-hearted attitude is, lackadaisical. You, can, you know, it's, it's people who have this kind of attitude. Well, if I make it to church good, if I don't, fine doesn't really matter, one way or the other. If I read my Bible today, fine. If I don't, not a big deal. If I don't pray today, 
No big deal. If I do, great. But if I don't, it's okay. That's a half-hearted attitude. Okay, so he, you know, that some of those things will keep us from bearing fruit. Perhaps it's just being careless. We could care less about our walk with the Lord. It could be lukewarmness. Remember what God said about being lukewarm? Book of Revelation. Spew you out of his mouth. He says he'd rather you be cold or hot, but not lukewarm. Can't straddle the fence. So what is it that causes us to be barren or brings devastation in our life? Could be any of these things. So what brought devastation in their life was sin. Sin sometimes will bring devastation in our life. So there was a devastation, but there was also lamentation. Look at verse number 13. <coughs> He's in Joel chapter 1, verse 13. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. How, ye ministers of the altar, come lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of God. So he says here that, that he's addressing these several groups of people. Verse in, ch- in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he's addressing old men. Look back up there in verse number 2. He said, hear this, ye old men. So he's addressing these old men. He's asking them, can, can you remember such a tragedy? Can you remember anything that's ever happened like this before? And he says, you tell your children, your great-grandchildren about this event. In the next verses, in verse number 5, look who he's addressing. He says, awake ye drunkards. In verse 5 through 7, he addresses the drunks, or the drunkards, and they're weeping and they're howling because, oh, all the grapes have been eaten. The vines have been destroyed. We have no more wine. So they're whining. (laughs) Well, they're not whining, but they're crying and howling because there's no more wine and and it's all gone. And isn't it sad that people will mourn over the loss of luxuries, over the things that they have, and they won't mourn over the loss of human life? Hmm. This has nothing to do with this, but I just wanted to share this with you. I was looking at last night. Just some numbers on abortion. In our, na- in our nation, this is just CDC numbers, which are not completely accurate because there are several states that don't have to support or don't report to them, which New York's one, California's one, which are two of our most liberal states. But over 95, or no, over 90 some percent, it wasn't 95, it's 90 couple percent of all abortions in this nation are for economic convenience. I mean, when you get down to it, it's for convenience. Because we, 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 we're, we want to finish our education or we want to, uh, we can't afford a child or, or we just don't want it right now. Ninety some percent for convenience. Florida, 90, over almost 96 percent are simply for convenience. That is sad. And people don't, people seem to care, you know, one way or the other. You know, even Christians many times, we say that we care and we're concerned, but what are we doing about it? You know, we have people right now that are protesting in front of the Supreme Court Justice House mad because they're wanting to overturn Roe versus Wade. There ought to be just as many people there and to keep them away from those houses as there are people there. I mean, people ought to be fighting for these justices because they're trying to do what is right. But yet, what are we doing? Very few. Very few are protesting against these people that are up there protesting. So he gets on the drunkards. Let's go on. So (coughs) then he turns to the worshipers. Look what he says in verses 8. He says, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, and the oil languisheth. So he's talking to the old men, the drunkards, the worshipers, the farmers, and then he gets to the priest in verses 13 and 14. All these people, 
He's confronting, and, and he's, he, they're crying out. They're howling. And he tells these priests in verses 13 and 14, if you look at that, he tells them to fast and pray over what's going on. When was the last time we fasted and prayed over what's going on in our nation? We pray, but when's the last time we were so burdened that we fasted, that we gave up a meal or two, or even just one a day, you know, or even one for a couple days? We're so burdened that we fasted over something. That's what he's telling them. Y'all need to be so burdened about what's taking place that you are fasting. And uh, we remember what, what God told them back in Deuteronomy. We'll keep going back to this. That if they would obey him, what would happen? They would have crops. Everything would be great. They would have the rains. Everything would be wonderful. But if they disobeyed, then they would see the plagues that the Egyptians saw, they would end up being in bondage. So that's what we're seeing. Because of their disobedience, listen, because of the disobedience of Christians failing to take a stand for the Word of God, we are seeing, we are reaping what we have sowed. We are reaping it. You say, well, it's not us. It is us. We, we can't blame it on anybody else. It is all us because we keep our mouth shut. You know what? I'm tired of keeping my mouth shut. We all need to be tired of keeping our mouths shut. When we go vote, we need to vote for people that are for life. And I want you to be careful when you vote. I want you to make sure you look at people. Because there are some, even on the Republican side, who say they are super conservative. But yet when you read what they believe, you will find, and I'm not going to name a name. If you want to know, you can come and ask me afterwards. There's one that is running who says that he is the conservative. But yet he believes it's okay to have an abortion in the cases of rape, incest, the health of the mom, or if the baby is, is mentally uh, handicapped or physically handicapped. Believes it's okay. You know what? Well, I don't know what you believe. This is what I believe. It's not okay in any case. None. Okay? I know what you're thinking. Well, what if the mom's going to die? We, you mentioned that. That is so rare. That is like a point. Zero, one percent chance that that takes place in our day because of the technology that we have. You know, Denise, it's so much more advanced. But yet, they harp on that. Something else, I mean, I don't know why I got off on this, but I'm going to. Uh, Jonathan, you was talking about the sonograms the other week. I was reading a study last night, and this is what they say. Well, the sonogram only affects, only changes the minds of about 1% of the people that take it. But you can look at the numbers. How many abortions are there per year? Anybody know the number? I can't remember right off the top of my head. How much? Yes. So 1% 1 1 of that is what? 120,000. 120,000 lives saved. <laughs> That's a lot. 120,000 that did not die because of a choice that somebody made. I'll take the 1%. I'll take a half percent. I would take one baby as long as it makes a difference. So there's a lamenting. They were crying over what they had done. What, what Joel is trying to get them to see is this. You need to be mournful over your sin, over the sin of the people. Listen, we as America, we need to be mourning over our sin. We need to repent and we need to mourn. As churches, we need to repent and we need to mourn our sin. We need to ask God to forgive us for failing Him and failing the, the, not just the children that have died, but all sin. Okay? We'll stop there. We won't get to the proclamation tonight. We'll get there later. If you have time, read through the rest of this book and uh, try to memorize some of those books. I'll tell you, I'll make it easy on you. We'll go back and just do the first five <laughs> if you want to. Uh, Cody had those down pat there for a while. Just we're going to be, uh, be praying for the service Sunday, be praying for the message. Uh, I'm looking at a couple different things right now. God hadn't given peace either way, but just, just pray and uh, pray that God would just uh, give me direction and uh, pray that God would, pray God would meet with us in a great and mighty way.
Okay. Let's stand our feet. We'll close in a word of prayer. Cody, you close for us tonight.